to this uh, first Abdus Salam Memorial Lecture, uh, Overview of Particle Physics after the Higgs Discovery uh, by uh, Professor Fernando Cuedo. So uh, before I tell you something about Fernando, I'd like to uh, give you some rationale as to why we have this memorial lecture. So as you all know, Abdus Salam is uh, one of the creators of the standard model of elementary particles, which I think is one of the great achievements of humanity. In 1979, he shared the Nobel Prize for Physics with uh, Sheldon Glashow and Stephen Weinberg. But besides his extensive contributions to physics, he created the International Center for Theoretical Physics, the ICTP in Trieste, in Italy in 1964. This institution is a unique institution in the world with the mission of promoting science in the developing world. And it has contributed to the growth of science in India and elsewhere in the developing world and also to the establishment of similar institutions in various parts of the world. The uh, happening of the ICTS, the International Center for Theoretical Sciences of the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in India has been in part inspired by ICTP, with which some of us uh, and some of us also present in the audience, have had a long and important association. And uh, I can simply testify that uh, our early efforts at the Tata Institute, beginning in 1984, in the area of string theory, were very strongly supported by Abdul Salam. And uh, I wonder what we would have done without that type of support in those early years. And uh, many of us actually have uh, been associated with the ICTP uh, in various capacities over all these years. So uh, <clears throat> we thought that uh, it is very important actually to, now that the ICTS is here for around five, six years, to uh, join hands with the ICTP and uh, try to do things together. After all, we are situated in India. In fact, this morning, uh, let me tell you that uh, we signed a memorandum of understanding of cooperation and doing things together, which we will follow up. And in fact, the present activity uh, is part of the joint uh, uh, ICTS, ICTP biology program. There's a very wonderful school that is uh, uh, going on at the moment on systems biology, which is organized uh, in collaboration with uh, ICTP and the Indian Institute of Science and the NCBS, all of us in Bangalore. <clears throat> so for all these reasons, uh, at ICTS, we wanted to honor Professor Salam, who was the founding director of ICTP. And we are very happy that the first lecturer is Fernando Cuedo, the present director of ICTP, who is leading ICTP in an exemplary fashion. So Fernando obtained his early education in Guatemala, and his PhD is from the University of Texas at Austin with Steve Weinberg. And he had research appointments in many important institutions in the world, like the CERN Laboratory in Geneva and uh, the Los Alamos Laboratory in the United States before he joined as a faculty member of the Department of Applied Mathematics and Theoretical Physics of the University of Cambridge, where he's still a professor on Lien to ICTP. He's also a fellow of the uh, Gonville and Keyes College. And uh, let me remind you that uh, there are a couple of other fellows from India, at least I know, of this college. One of them is Dr. Homi Bhabha. And the other one is uh, Dorabji Tata. They were also fellows of the 
Gonville and Keys College of Cambridge University. Fernando was appointed a director of ICTP in October 2009. He's a well-known theoretical particle physicist with wide-ranging research interests in string theory, phenomenology, and cosmology. And for his contributions, he was awarded the 1998 ICTP Prize in recognition for contributions to super string theory. He's a string theorist. Most directors are string theorists. <laughs> <laughs> it's a joke. Okay, so with these few words, uh, I'd like to invite Fernando to give his talk. Okay. <clears throat> thank you very much, Spinta, for a nice introduction. So thank you, all of you, for coming. and. and uh, so it's an honor for me to be the first uh, lecturer for this um, Salam Memorial uh, Lectures, um, particularly because uh, I very much sympathize with the figure of Abdul Salam. I am a big, big admirer of his contributions to physics, but also for developing countries. Myself, coming from Guatemala, he has always been a figure that uh, is a, a, a big man to, to follow and to, to try to continue with his uh, ideas to promote science in developing countries. And it's, it's an honor for me to be the director of ICDP and be able to continue with, with his uh, this is a, um, mission. So, um, so this is the talk in principle will be, physics will be about the, the major discovery about the, the Higgs particle in the last uh, year and a half or so. Uh, but I will start saying something about uh, Abdul Salam and ICTP. So this is a famous phrase of uh, Abdul Salam, which is uh, we always keep uh, repeating it because it means a lot to what uh, is it, how he thought that the scientific thought is important for all humankind, in particular for developing countries, and how he lived out of that uh, belief. And if we are Okay, I will try to see if I can show a, a sure three minutes of a film that was recently made about Abu Salam. I hope it works. Yes. The sound is not. to consider all sorts of ideas, much more important than <laughs> <laughs> new ideas uh, than we lost it, eh? Sorry about that. I don't think this point to try, but you were not listening to the no. So I leave it to you. So I brought some copies of the movie, you want to see it. Uh, uh, it's also available, I think, at iTunes University. I was only showing three minutes of the movie, so it's not a big loss. But it's very inspiring, and I think it's, it's, it's a beautiful movie about the, the life and the thoughts about uh, Salam. Sorry, it didn't work. OK, so let, then let me just say some words about ICTP, which is the center that he created. And we are located in, in Trieste, in Italy, and this is our campus. It's a nice setting. Uh, for those of you who haven't been there, we have a, a guest house which is uh, nearby here, so it's in front of the sea, so it's very inspiring. Besides the science, it's also a nice place to be. The castle is not ours, if, if you're thinking about it. <laughs> okay, so ICDP, I will go quickly. And uh, is, what is ICDP? Uh, it was just the phrase I always repeat about what defines ICDP is the first and leading Global Research Institution for Scientific Research and Education, with emphasis on developing countries. 
And the word I always emphasize is global, because that, that makes ICDP unique in the sense that we cover every single country in the world. As Penta mentioned, it was created in 1964, mostly by Abdul Salam, and uh, in collaboration with the International Atomic Energy Agency and the Italian government. And uh, something I always like to emphasize, that it was created in 64, and Salam did, got the Nobel Prize in 79. His paper for the Nobel Prize was in 67. So he was a young, active researcher when he was doing at the same time this, uh, this uh, major uh, innovation of the creating an institute. And uh, his research at the IC was done while well, he was doing, working at ICTP. And so it's not that he got a Nobel Prize and then started creating something, but he did it while he was still a young researcher. Uh, then since 1995, we have been run, been run by a tripartite agreement between the Italian government, the IAEA, and UNESCO. Most of the budget comes from the Italian government, but the administration comes from UNESCO. So we are a United Nations institution. We have uh, several research groups from uh, high energy physics to complex matter, mathematics, and so on, applied physics, including also now climate change and so on. And we, since I arrived as a director, we have been moving in different directions also to open new areas of research, renewable energies, quantitative biology, high performance computing, quantitative biology, it's uh, one of the activities that we're running now, uh, together with ICTS, is, is one of the activities in this uh, subject. So we have many activities to bring scientists to ICTP and to work abroad that I invite you to look at and see in our website. Um, so I don't want to, to spend too much time on that. So conferences cover, we have the other 60 conferences per year at ICTP, and we organize another 15 abroad. And uh, we have of the order of um, 130,000 visits, scientists visiting since 1970. And this is what I mean by global, 188 countries represented. So every single country in the world have participated in activities at ICTP, essentially. And you can see the distribution is very much uh, uniform against, among developing and developed countries, except that we fund scientists from developing countries, and the ones from developed countries, they participate on their own funding or refunding their lecturers. And we also have many activities in developing countries, and we have some of this thing. We have affiliated centers, networks, projects, and so on, that we organize and help to fund. So it's not only that we concentrate in a, in activities in Trieste, but we try to have activities in every single developing country. So let me just say a few words about India. Uh, over the years, we have had many visitors from India. Actually, India is our number one country, and the number of visitors is of the order of 300, uh, more or less, over the past few years. And we have, uh, we have to work very hard not to give prizes to Indian scientists, I have to say, <laughs> because they are so good. And uh, so, essentially, this is, these are the recent people who have uh, won the prizes. We have this ICTP prize. Uh, you can recognize some of the names. Spentia is one of, the, one of the earlier winners also. Uh, you can see Ashok Sain, of course, in, in, in the 1980s. And uh, to sum up, which I don't want to spend too much time on this, is, uh, this is a, a summary of what activities that Indian scientists participate with us. And that's something I, I, we have a similar plot for every single country uh, that, that we work with. And uh, India, as I told you, is, is, is the country that participates the most in our activities. <clears throat> but uh, it is surprising, remember, that our name is International Center for Theoretical Physics. Look at this number, 32%. 32% is, the, max, is the, the majority of, our, of, of, of what we do, the, the biggest uh, program. And that program is called TRIL. TRIL means Training of Researchers in Italian Laboratories. So it's a purely experimental initiative. It's a program for, for experimental scientists. And these scientists, usually we don't see them because we uh, work uh, all, all the applications together with the laboratories and they come directly to ICDP and we send them to the laboratories. So they actually don't, co don't come to ICTCP. And this so happens to be the, the activity that is more used in India. And then we have participation in conferences, postdoctoral fellows, uh, the associate program, which is very popular, and so on. So we have all these activities that we cover and, uh, and has been very well distributed in the, in the Indian uh, community. 
Okay, so I think I will stop saying that. The only thing I wanted to emphasize is the role that I, all this was created, of course, by Abdul Salam, and this, I'm very pleased he's being honored on, on, on this occasion. And uh, as he always remains as an inspiration for all of us to continue working in this uh, mission. Uh, sorry, this is the other slide. This is the distribution of funds from different countries. Continents. It's more or less distributed up to the population of the countries. We are also starting uh, branches of ICDP, now in Sao Paulo, uh, then in Mexico, Turkey, and Beijing, and so on. That's something, those, some of the initiatives we are trying to work to move further. This is, uh, we're having an ICTP 50th anniversary campaign, and these are statements by the Director General of UNESCO, the IAEA, and Stephen Hawking supporting ICTP for these activities. And uh, I just wanted to remind or tell you that it's uh, October 6 to 9, 2014, we'll celebrate our 50th anniversary, so we hope to have a major event. So please uh, pay attention to this. We hope to, to make it a big, big uh, celebration and major scientific uh, uh, activity almost one year from now. Okay, so any comments or questions before I start the physics? No? Okay. Very good. So the topic is about uh, the Higgs discovery. And uh, <clears throat> I have to say this, uh, since I have been active in, in doing research, very few major discoveries have happened. And uh, I can point out probably for me the three biggest ones if so, someone who's not in the field can see, at least it's nice to, to see, for, for I can see the highlights of many in the last, I don't know, more than 20 years, is uh, the discovery in 1992 of the fluctuations of the cosmic microwave background. This is a major discovery because that gave us an idea of, of, the, of even our ori origin because all this background uh, radiation that we are getting from space, almost uniform, it's not actually uniform, so but it's distributed with different colors, different colors with different temperature. And these fluctuations, when you extrapolate by the expansion of the universe, are the source of the distribution of galaxies or the structure in, in the universe. So that means that the, the structure of the, the whole universe now is due to some small fluctuations in the very early universe, and this had been detected. And the Nobel Prize was given in 2006. This is a major, major discovery. Then in 1998, it was a surprise discovery dark energy, sorry, there's energy missing. Uh, and the, the, the idea is that the universe, whatever happened at the beginning of the Big Bang, it started to expand, probably in an accelerated expansion called inflation, probably. But then it started to expand in a normal way, like a power law. But then suddenly, it, it starts to expand, in a, uh, again, in an exponential way. So it, it is accelerating, not only expanding, but accelerating. And that's the source of a, it's a, it's a big surprise from most of us. It was discovered in 1998, Nobel Prize in 2011, and we still don't understand what this dark energy is. I will say some words later on about it. And uh, I would say comparable to these two major things, and probably uh, I personally felt even more excited when it happened, is the discovery of the Higgs, 2012, and it was given the Nobel Prize for this year, the Higgs particle. So I will say a few words about this. So this happened on the 4th of July, 2012, and uh, it's at CERN. This is, people call it the Higgs Dependence Day. <laughs> and it was a major celebration. <laughs> okay, it was a major celebration. You can see uh, this is the auditorium of CERN. This is the, some of the, the past directors of CERN and everybody celebrating the, when the announcement was made. Was, you can see here before the announcement, Higgs entering, a little bit nervous. And I, I prefer, I like this photograph not because he looks very good, but I found myself here. So, <laughs> so, so I, happen, I, was, I happen to be there at the moment, and I have to say it's one of the most exciting moments of my life. I would say in, as a scientific, it's, it's very exciting to be present and it's at the announcement of this, such a major discovery. And uh, the work of his, uh, Hiller, Higgs and Angler, who are I mean, the, the ones who shared the Nobel Prize this year. You can recognize some faces here. It's Fabiola Gianotti is the, the head of one of the major laboratories of Atlas, which is good. She was very, very active and professional. 
Okay, so and this was discovered at the LEC. LEC is the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva. This is a, this 27 kilometers of circumference uh, <coughs> tunnel that, uh, and it's, it is the biggest experiment in history. And it has, it's actually four experiments. It's just called CMS, Atlas, I'm sorry, CMS, LSCB, Atlas, and Alice. CMS and, LS, and Atlas are the ones who participated in the discovery of the Higgs. It's good to have two competing experiments, so at the end they confirm each other's results. And uh, um, Alice is for other kind of experiments, just to collide heavy ions to explore some other sources, uh, states of matter. And LSCB is to look for the difference between matter and antimatter. So they have also found some interesting results. Just to give you an idea of the magnitude of not only of the, the one of the detectors, this is Atlas, but also the collaboration. And this is a good example of international collaboration. Some people from many, many countries have participated on, on this activity. Uh, I have heard people from CERN giving talks and showing essentially to say that this is people from all over the world participate on this. And I correct them because I mean, people from all over the world come, come to ICDP. To CERN, it's, it's, it's all continents probably, but not, not all the world, unfortunately, not yet. Uh, so it's, it's, there's a lot of room for having people from, from more uh, underdeveloped countries to be. There's no reason why not, they should not participate on, on, on these activities, but still already CERN is becoming a, a worldwide experiment, not only, not only European, which is very good. So that's the tendency. So why is the Higgs discovery so important? If you're not convinced yet, I may not convince you, but, but uh, uh, this is how the way I, I see it. Uh, so let me try to go a little bit into the history of particle physics and see how the Higgs fits into the whole picture. So first of all, let's see the composition of, of the matter that we see, the visible matter. And this is the famous plot where you have the matter can be classified in two types of particles, the fermions and the bosons. Actually, bosons is the name after the famous Indian physicist, Bose and fermions, Italian physicist Fermi. And the difference between the two is that they carry this property called spin. Uh, one, the fermions have se uh, semi-integer, um, uh, yes, uh, half an integer spin, one half, three halves, and so on, whereas the bosons are, have integer spin. And spin can be always thought as, as an internal degree of uh, rotation in, in, the, in the particles, but actually, being quantum mechanics, these are quantized, and they have uh, this particular set of values. And they behave completely different from each other. The fermions are usually claimed to be the components of matter, the leptons and the quarks. So the leptons have this electron, which is the most famous particle, with the corresponding neutrino. The quarks have the up and down. With up and down, you make all the nuclei. You make protons and nuclei, and, uh, protons and neutrons. Uh, that were the nuclei of all the atoms. And the electrons go around to make every single atom <coughs> that we know. The neutrinos are produced, uh, say, in the sun, say, by, by, by these uh, thermonuclear reactions. And many of them are crossing us. I mean, billions of them are crossing our body and, but, uh, because they couple very quickly. The interesting thing is that there are three copies of this. this these are enough to make all matter, but it happens to have three copies identical to, to the previous ones, except that they, have, they are heavier. This is, these quarks are heavier than these ones, and these quarks are heavier than these ones similar with this tau mu with respect to the electron. So this is the matter we know. And then the bosons, they, uh, they usually are the, the ones that mediate interactions. So the people, matter is, is I mean, are not only having the matter uh, uh, described, describe, but also how it interacts. And how the in matter interacts with matter is through exchanging other matter, which is now bosons. And uh, for instance, the electromagnetic interaction is mediated by photons. That means that one electron and another electron, when they interact with each other, they, are, they exchange one photon, and so on. We know the photon very well. It has zero mass, no electric charge. And that describes one interaction. Then there are three particles, W minus plus and Z zero. They describe the uh, weak interactions. So together, all together describe what is called the electroweak interactions, which is precisely the unification that Salam, Weinberg, and Glashow did for their Nobel Prize. The strong interactions, that means the thing that hold the quarks together with each other, are mediated by another particle called the gluon. And the gluons, uh, again, are, they have zero mass, and they have uh, uh, no charge. 
and they all have this spin equals to one. The bosons can have any spin, zero, one, two, but all of the ones that we know have a spin one. Then the theory, the standard model to describe all these interactions, needs two things. The fourth interaction, which is gravity, that should be a particle associated to gravity called the graviton. Again, it has no charge, no mass, but the spin is not one, but two. And that partly is their source to making gravity more complicated, and that's why gravity is the interaction that we understand the least. But then, in this list, there's nobody with a spin zero, and the spin zero is what the Higgs has. So the spin is the simplest particle, in this sense, because it has zero spin. And it's needed to make sense of the whole picture of the standard model, and I will mention more. Please interrupt me at any time. I'm uh, aiming the, the, this talk at people with scientific background, not necessarily high energy physics. I prefer I'm some students, some people may be too trivial. So, but you can interrupt me and ask me any questions if you have any, any question or doubt or disagreement. Or agreement also. Okay, so this are again the forces, strong, electromagnetic, gravitational, and weak. And the mediators are gluons, photons, and these bosons, W and Z, and hopefully, in principle, the graviton. And uh, we, uh, somehow, the graviton we haven't seen, and partly, partly because gravity is very weak. And emphasizing, because this plays a role later, the bosons and fermions are completely different particles. One way to describe in a naive way is that bosons are described by numbers for which commute, AB equals to B times A, whereas fermions are described by numbers which anti-commute, AB equals minus B times A. Some people can call these super numbers, and these numbers just as a way to call. And the difference is that the bosons can all, because of this description, the bosons can all fit in one single state, and they can accumulate in one single state. Like a laser, for instance, this is a good example. Whereas the fermions, they cannot be in one single state, so they, they, there is kind of a, they, they cannot be several fermions together. And that's, that explains essentially the whole structure of matter, because the fermions, they, 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 they satisfy the, the, the Pauli equation principle, for instance, whereas the bosons do not. So there's an example, there was bose einstein condensates, but there's a condensation, all the bosons in one single state coming together. So, and then the standard model summarizing is quarks, leptons with interactions. The graviton, and here the Higgs is written with a question mark more or less because it, it, it yet, yet to be confirmed. This is a two years old uh, plot. And uh, it is nice that this all come from the concept called the broken symmetry. And for those who know the group theory, this is a symmetry called SU3 cross U2 cross U1 that is broken to SU2 cross U1. And by the breaking mechanism is where the Higgs enters, and, uh, and I will say something more about it later. So, as I said before, each particle has an associated field. <coughs> and uh, the photon, for instance, is a particle of light, has an associated field, which is the electromagnetic field, and so on. The quark has a quark field, the electron has an electron field, and so on. And uh, the scalar field is the simplest one for those pin zero. That would be for a boson. Because that's the simplest one, because it can only, since it has no spin, it has only magnitude, no direction. So usually in examples, we have, you know, temperature and pressure are kind of those fields. So it takes a field, take a value in the, in the space and time, say, different values, reflected here by different colors, but there is no direction. Okay. <clears throat> and the particles are the small fluctuations of this field. This is essentially the, 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 where quantum mechanics enter, just a, so you have a field as a uh, fundamental object, and then the particles are fluctuations of the field. Then the vector fields, so for instance, a spin one, usually, uh, bosons, they have magnitude and direction. Typical in classical physics, we know electric field, magnetic fields, and they have not only size with different colors, but they also have directions reflected here by different arrows. So, so again, just to exemplify that the scalar field, the one with spin zero, is simpler, is the simplest because it has no directions. And surprisingly, it had not been observed in nature until last year. So the idea of symmetry breaking, sorry, this is written in Spanish. For the few of you who don't understand Spanish, <laughs> uh, I will say. Um, the idea, you can see this, this profile of energy. It looks symmetric. But the symmetric, the, the symmetric point is here, and it's not the minimum. The minimum is not a symmetric point. So that's the idea that, that the vacuum, so the minimum of energy, doesn't share the symmetry of the whole potential. That's the idea of, of a symmetry breaking. 
So you can, we cannot be sitting here because it will be unstable to move towards here. So probably more realistic, the Higgs field looks like this. There's a profile since, again, because it has a spin zero, it doesn't have direction, so it can have a different values. Contrary to the, uh, if you have a, a, a spin one field, it will carry some direction and it will break the symmetries of the special relativity or something. So, so it will not, uh, uh, but whereas a scalar field, they can have different values, different from zero, and they will not break any symmetries, any space-time symmetries. But they break uh, other kinds of symmetries, like the shape of this potential. For instance, the, the, the Higgs can have a profile, and this is not an arbitrary function. This is precisely the kind of function that the Higgs can have. It's either this or just like paraboloid, because it's those two options. In the, in the paraboloid case, you don't break the symmetry. The minimum is symmetric. In this case, you break the symmetry because the minimum is not symmetric. And, and, and then you can see here this excitation is usually called a to mode. And, and the, the vacuum, so the state of minimum energy, is not symmetric. So that's the idea of, of symmetry breaking. And who is driving it is the, the, the energy profile of one scalar field, and that's the field we call the Higgs. For uh, using the fixed mechanism for the electroweak interactions, Glasher, Weinberg, and Salam share the Nobel Prize. This is the, the three of them uh, in the, the day of the Nobel Prize, 1979. <coughs> So that's a, that's a major contribution, and as, as uh, Spinta said, this is one of the major achievements of humankind, is to get the standard model to work. And they, they got the Nobel Prize, independent of the Higgs being discovered or not. Uh, so it could have been, that there is something else that drives the symmetry breaking. And uh, so that's the exciting, it took another many, many years, 30 more years for the Higgs to be discovered. Remember, there's uh, other particles, the particles W and Z that I mentioned before that mediate the interactions, the weak interactions. They, they were discovered in 1982. So uh, how many years? 30 years before they discovered the Higgs. So the nice thing is that all this can be described by a very simple equation. And CERN has this uh, T-shirt where you more or less summarize the standard model in this series. This is a Lagrangian. In the Lagrangian, this part is, is the the kinetic terms of all the mediators of the interactions, the photon, the Ws and Zs, and so on. This is the kinetic energy of the matter particles, the quarks and leptons. This is a conjugate. This is the couplings of the, all the matter particles to this particle phi, which is the Higgs. This is the kinetic energy of the Higgs, and this is the Higgs, potential energy. That's the profile I was showing to you. Uh, one big miss here is that gravity is not included. So CERN, as you can see, collides particles. They care very much about the strong and electroweak interactions. So gravity is not included in this picture. But ICDP is better. Mm -hmm. So we created a t-shirt mm -hmm. with the gravity included. Here you have R, and R is the curvature of space and time, which is the metric. And, then this is the, and, and that couples to everything else. And, uh, and that's precisely give you Einstein's equations. Here you have gravity and then all the other interactions. So we, we claim that this is our universe so far described by this equation. And here, H is the Higgs, so we call it Higgs. And the T-shirt is only four euros for those who are interested to buy. Mm -hmm. okay. So I wrote in the T-shirt the potential for the Higgs. I didn't tell you how it looks. I, I was showing you the picture before, this nice three-dimensional picture. It's more or less, I, don't have, I, won't, I won't have too many equations but this is one of the fields I will, I, I, I will have. This is the potential for the Higgs. This, this is the modulus of Higgs. It's a, a complex field. So there, uh, it's, it's a quartic potential, and that's why you can try to plot this in the computer. And depending on the sign of this term, it will look the shape I was showing you or a paraboloid. If it is minus, it has the shape I was showing you before. If it is plus, it only looks like a paraboloid. And the Higgs is, a, you, saw, you saw the mass parameter there that gives the mass to the Higgs, but on top, in the couplings in this uh, uh, equation, the Higgs also couples to all the other particles. And the way, when it couples to all the other particles, it provides a background where the other particles are moving, and that gives them a mass. And uh, a way to, to uh, show this is that, imagine one person is snow, but moving very fast. This is the background, there's no snow. So that's a zero mass object, because it has no, no inertia to prove. Whereas if you move with uh, some other objects here, 
it has more, more inertia, more friction, so it's, it's, uh, it has some, it's, you feel heavier, it's a light object. And if you try to walk by yourself in the snow, then it's a heavy object. And so that's, that gives a mass. So essentially, you feel a mass because of the presence of your background, and that's what the Higgs is. So essentially, the Higgs is so important. And one of the reasons it's so important, because essentially, it gives a source for masses in the, in the, in, for all the other particles. Of course, there is other main source of through the strong interactions, but essentially, the, the, the parameter that, this, that shows the mass of the particles is a coupling to the Higgs, is the, is the value of the Higgs at the, in the potential. Essentially, just to get quickly, in the potential I was showing you, the fact that the minimum is different from zero, that gives you one scale, and that value of that scale is what generates masses for all particles. Any questions so far? Yeah. Okay, so uh, infrastructure, the Higgs is very important. It's essentially what people say, the source of all masses, this background Higgs uh, uh, is, is, is provided in the masses, but hope you don't get offended. Uh, you're not a fan of Tarantino, don't, uh, uh, excuse me for that, but uh, just to, to uh, some people abuse the name of the God particle, it has nothing to do with God. So in that sense, we can stop. So you, I ask uh, any questions you can have, but there's no, 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 no reference to the particle having anything to do with God. Okay. So, uh, and then this is one of the pictures for the discovery. Particular mass, very interesting mass, of course, by the way. Uh, and the, once you see the background, you expect, and this is the fluctuation, it's a big fluctuation, and the fluctuation goes more than five sigmas in the distribution, then you see it's a discovery, and, and that's, that's what the, it was announced in, uh, in July the 4th, 2012. But not only for one, one measurement, but several measurements, because the Higgs is produced in this way. For instance, Higgs is produced by coalitions of particles, like then, say, protons against protons. The protons have gluons inside, so the gluons in the protons collide, and they exchange the heaviest particle that they couple the strongest is the top quark. And then the top quark at the end, they say that they, they, they case into this particle Higgs. And the Higgs by itself, then decay into photons and so on. And then what the experimentalists will see is the end result is the, the photons that have been uh, produced by the Higgs decay. But then the Higgs can also decay in other particles, here four leptons. So, and then this can also be outcomes and so on. So all of these different decays have been observed and essentially agreed with what, what the theoretical prediction. So this is a major uh, discovery. So that's what, this is all the different, different ways of producing the Higgs and different decay modes, and they all fit within the expectation for a particle of the order of 126 GeV. So that was an exciting moment. So this particle is there, and, uh, and uh, it couples in the way that is expected to be the Higgs particle. So again, the detection shows, the, again, the background and the, the bump is, uh, the, the, is, is uh, the particle. Here's another closer view. And, uh, and now people ask during that year if this is the standard model Higgs, so you can check if the spin is zero, one, or two. There were several check, uh, ways to check because there are the different uh, of ways to see how it behaves on the, the rotations. And the sense of the doubt was between zero and two. And it's essentially 90% probability that is zero. Um, is it scalar or pseudo scalar? So there are particles who are scalars and pseudo scalars, which don't, uh, are not invariant on the, on the parity. And the Higgs has to be scalar, and again, it's 90% sure that it's a scalar. And it's elementary or composite, most probably it is elementary. Sorry, my Spanish came out <laughs> for some reason. <coughs> and. Uh, the other important thing is that the couplings are proportional to the mass. So that's, uh, that's what makes the Higgs special. It gives mass to the particle. So the heavier the particle is, the stronger the coupling. And so that's how it's going to come out. So all the particles I was showing you in my plots, they couple to the Higgs in a way proportional to the mass. If you are heavier, couple is stronger to the Higgs or not. So some, my Italian colleagues, they call the standardissimo model, because uh, that makes Higgs very happy. Essentially, it has satisfied all the qualities that uh, the Higgs was supposed to have. So it's not only discovering of a particle, but it's discovering of a particle that exactly behaves like the Higgs. And that explains why, within a year and a half, they were given the, the Nobel Prize. Okay, so this is some of the pictures of the events. And of course, not everybody celebrated. This is uh, something in the same day in the news. 
some of my colleagues were angry at uh, uh, our friend Gordy Kane, who didn't do that much for the Hicks, but he, he, he bet to Stephen Hawking $100. Hawking always loses all the bets that he has. And uh, he lost this one with, uh, with uh, Gordy. And of course, since Stephen is a source of uh, media attention, so the next day of the discovery of the Hicks, Gordy was on the first plane, first uh, uh, page of some of the news, uh, newspapers. And it's only because he won the bet with the Stephen. Uh, also, Tini Veldman, a great physicist, Nobel Prize himself in 1999 for his contributions also to the standard model. He didn't believe about the Higgs. And I remember passing through his office when we were at CERN. Always he had this, you know, you remember, he says, no Higgs outside of his office. Uh, he even was in a conference I was in 2011 when they were, the first hints about the Higgs were announced. And during that same week, he gave a talk against the Higgs. So it's very committed. We haven't seen him after that. So, mm -hmm. Okay, so what kind of implications this discovery has? First, of all, it's something is easy to say, but it's the first fundamental scalar particle ever discovered. It's something impressive. Eh? The simplest particle, spin zero, first particle with spin zero ever discovered. And I said, told you, scalars are the simplest, the spin zero, and it's we have been using scalar particles in theory, in theory for many, many years. In cosmology, those are the typical models of inflation for describing early universe, is through the profile of energy of a scalar particle. Uh, for supersymmetry, supersymmetry, I will tell you later what it is, it predicts that there have to be scalar particles as part of predictions. String theory also predicts you have to have string, scalar particles. So, and so in some sense, you want to, so that gives you some optimism that all these ideas that people have been working and defending for over the years, they may have something, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a triumph for them because at least things that are natural in these uh, uh, initiatives uh, is, is ob objects with uh, scalar particles. And, uh, and now we know for sure that there are scalar particles in nature which are fundamental. As I told you, this is the origin of masses. It's not trivial. It completes the standard model. As I told you, I was showing you the picture with all the particles and so on. And over all these years, the standard model was missing this extra factor. This factor was missing, and it's complete. So that now we can say we know physics up to the scale of, say, 1,000 up to the mass of the proton. So, so at 1,000 times the mass of the proton. So, uh, so that's very good. So that's a major, major achievement, and uh, so that says we don't understand physics. Uh, the world is behaving the way that theorists have always believed, and that's also a uh, reassurance for all, for, for all, the, uh, all, who are, all of us who work in theoretical physics to see that the, what comes out of equations actually is actually seen and discovered in the experiments. But it's also the source of several problems, hierarchy problem. Again, it's something we have been working for many years, assuming that the Higgs was there, it creates a problem. So people have been working on the hierarchy problem for many, many, many years. And now that the Higgs is discovered, now the problem makes sense. So before, that was a speculation, because if the particle exists, it would be problematic. Now people say, this particle exists, so then there is a problem. I will say a little bit more, more about what that, this hierarchy problem is. Essentially, the mass of the Higgs is 125 GeV. And it could, there is no reason why it's, it's that small it could be much bigger. I will say in a second. It also is, create a potential instability of our universe, the value of the coupling. Do you remember these are the couplings I was showing you in my slide about the potential of the Higgs, the mass, the coupling, and the cosmological constant. So these three are sources of problems. And I will emphasize each of them in, uh, next. There is something that people usually don't <coughs> emphasize, and I would like to make the point here. It's a bit controversial. We know now the Higgs is six. The standard model is, clo is close. We also know that gravity exists, and the two things are together, like in the T-shirt I was showing you. Of course, gravity has not been quantized. That's the main problem. So gravity is only at the classical level there. But it's there. You look for solutions of equations of motions. That's what we do with the, in classical physics. There's one solution. You have a, the Higgs potential and gravity. You look for potential solutions. And there's one solution, which is we live in flat four dimensions, and the Higgs potential has that with a minimum. But there are many other solutions in which the same theory, in which we live in three dimensions, with the fourth dimension being a circle, and, and the Higgs is there. So and there are many, many solutions like that. 
Uh, this, there's a paper two or three years ago, you know, maybe five years ago, showing that it's the standard model. It's not a, I told you now the standard model is true, period. And from the standard model, you can have this thing that you have many other solutions. And this, each of these solutions give you different universes, which are not ours, because they are universes that look in smaller dimensions. Okay? So that's not a speculation of a, of a complicated theoretical framework like a string theory or so. This is a consequence of a theory that we know is correct, the standard model plus classical gravity. Okay? So this is a major implication. We have now completed the standard model, and as prediction, the standard model, the theory that we have been tested experimentally, predicts that there are many other universes. Okay, so this is important. And, and, uh, and on top of those, these three problems, and I will go through them now. Problem one, because what if a constant problem? Essentially, this is, is tell you the height of the, of, the, of, the, of the potential energy for the Higgs, essentially. Well, essentially, the potential energy, or the, the energy overall of the standard model, but you can see it uh, directly here in the, the, the contribution of the Higgs for this energy. And uh, I, to, to make it dramatic, I put it in this way. There is one, old, one uh, unit of, of, um, of, of, of mass that I will show in the next two, three slides, which is called uh, uh, the Planck mass. So in that natural units, because one constant should be zero point, and then you can measure here. If you count them all, it will be 120. <laughs> it's 120 zeros, one. So this is the value of the, minimum, of, 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 the, of the energy, say, of, the, uh, of con contribution of, of all the standard models. Uh, 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 sorry, the, the, uh, sorry the, the, the energy that has been observed, this is the energy that has been observed, this is the dark energy I was showing you before, and uh, in, in the Higgs, the contribution of the Higgs will be how high this is from zero. So that's the picture to have. Okay, that's a major problem. Why is such a small quantity there? And that's the issue that I told dark energy is the thing that was telling you that the universe is accelerating. And uh, this, is, this is dark energy, and dark energy contributes most of the contribution of energy to the universe is not very nice. Uh, so essentially, it contributes to the order of 70% of the energy of the universe. There's another part of the universe called dark matter that I will mention later, and this is our contribution, which is more less than 1% or so. Uh, so essentially, this is a major issue. This very small quantity, this very small quantity makes most of the energy that we see in the universe today. So it's a very challenging thing. Is, why is it so small and why is it so dominant? Problem two is the hierarchy problem. As I told you, the Higgs has a mass, but when the Higgs couples to other particles, in this case I show here the, the heaviest particle, which is the top quark. When the Higgs couples to the top quark, or, or it, it, it can, Say yeah, here produce a top quark and then and then the two uh, produce two quark, top quarks the top quarks join together and produce a Higgs. This interaction, eventually, what it does, it contributes, it makes the heavy, the Higgs heavier. How heavy it can be is you can cal calculate because this interaction can be computed. But this, this is called a loop, the Feynman diagram. When you compute this, you get the uh, essentially a quadratic divergence. It's an infinite value. So that means that the, this is a contribution to the Higgs mass. So the Higgs mass, we say, is 125 GeV, so 125 times the mass of the proton. <coughs> this contribution makes it as big as you can have. How big can it be? Is the, we don't know because the, 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 there are, we know that the standard model is valid only to, to, to the scale that, uh, at, at, that it has been measured for, say, 1,000 times the mass of the proton. But we know that gravity that has a much bigger scale, which is this m plank that I told you, so it can be as big as in Planck, and which is 15 orders of magnitude bigger. So why is it that the mass of the Higgs is so small and not bigger? That's the hierarchy problem. So naturally, all these interactions will produce, will create, make the, the Higgs heavier and heavier and heavier, much heavier, uh, far heavier uh, than, than it has been measured. So again, now that the Higgs is there, this is a major problem, and this is the whole the hierarchy problem. I put it as number two because the, the cosmological constant, the dark, dark, uh, cosmological constant, dark energy problem, is, I think it's a bigger tuning, it's a bigger uh, on naturalness than the hierarchy, but both are, are bad problems. So this is my second equation. So for, for those of you who don't follow uh, high energy physics, I will just ask you to concentrate for two minutes on this slide. 
This is uh, what the standard of units that I was telling you before. This is called, uh, this is Max Planck, you don't recognize him. I always wonder why the, uh, he had this hairstyle of the, uh, one, more than one century ago, it doesn't look like a, like a scientist, but uh, he is, is Max Planck. And uh, he came out with this idea, which is, uh, um, take what is the natural units of, of, of energy, of mass, and so on, you can use, you have a fundamental theory. The fundamental theory will be quantum mechanical and introduces this, common, this uh, uh, constant called H bar, which is uh, the Planck constant. It has to be relativistic, so it introduces the, the speed of light, see? And it has to include gravity, so it has to, you have to have the Newton's constant. So uh, each of these constants, they have units. So he combined them in different ways, using just dimensional analysis, to get units of order of, uh, to scale, say, uh, uh, energy units. So this combination gives you something of units of energy, and then you get 10 to the 19 GeV. So 10 to the 19 GeV means that this is the energy for which gravity, quantum mechanics, and relativity are valid at the same time. So this is the limit of our knowledge so far, because we don't know gravity at the quantum level. So that means that we know physics at scales smaller than 10 to the 19, GeV is giga electron volts. This is the sense of one giga electron volt is the mass of the proton. So we know <coughs> physics, we can know physics up to scales smaller than 10 to the 19 GeV, but not at 10 to the 19 or, 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 or more. So this simple formula, just pure dimensional analysis, just check the values of H, C, and G, and look for something of the units of energy or mass. Uh, and that gives you uh, the limits of our knowledge in energy. You do the same exercise for, uh, for length, and then you get 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, this combination of H, G, and C. And do the same thing for time, and get this combination of 10 to the minus 44 seconds. So that means that distances smaller than 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, we don't know any physics about. And time, say after the Big Bang, smaller than 10 to the minus 44 seconds, we don't know anything. So the reason we don't know what happened at the Big Bang, or what we don't know at this, what happened at very small distances, is because we don't understand gravity at the fundamental level, at the microscopic level. And then you can be, you can be seen by these units. Now in these units, just, uh, just to give you an idea of, of how we are, we are more or less here, one meter. This is our size, more or less. This is the, the size of an atom, this is the size of a nucleo, nucleus of an atom. This is where LHC is testing now, the, the, the 10 to the minus 18 meters. And this is the Planck length, 10 to the minus 35 meters. It's 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, 10 to the minus 35 meters. So we are a long way, essentially halfway, between our size and the LHC to explore. Okay. And uh, that's the natural units of, 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 uh, of length. And uh, so as I told you, the hierarchy problem was that if the mass of, of, the, of, the, of the Higgs particle was of this, in this range, changing mass to, to length by inverse, uh, then you need the natural value to have it will be something even as big as 15 orders of magnitude bigger. Okay. And also in the, same, in the cosmological constant case, you will say the cosmological constant is, uh, I told you, is, is um, 10 to the minus 120 times this unit of energy. So it's, it's, it will go very, very far, far above. So those are how bad uh, we understand these two quantities. Okay, so this problem one and problem two, hierarchy and cosmology constant. Problem three is instability. Instability, the, the Higgs potential, I showed you looked like that, but then you start getting corrections, like uh, quantum mechanical corrections to, 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 to the different couplings that you have. And at some point, the standard model makes that constant lambda, which is the coupling in the, in the H to the four, becomes negative also. So then instead of going, continue growing, it makes it come down. So that will show instability because then our, uh, if we are sitting here, at some point we will decay and this will be unbounded from below, so it will be a collapse. So our universe essentially will disappear. So that will be very bad for us. And, uh, and, and that's, a, that's a possibility because, I mean, the corrections can drive this lambda to negative values and to instabilities. Okay. So, so those are the, the three problems, and so this is good because we need problems to keep uh, doing research, because so that's good. So, uh, but what do we do for the future? In the short term, there's a nightmare scenario. You know, LSC is closed for the next year and so. So 
when they will reopen, they will reopen with the double energy and more uh, uh, luminosity, more, more collisions per second. So we hope that they will discover something. But they may not discover anything. So that's, this is what we call the nightmare scenario. And the nightmare scenario, we have been talking about it even before the discovery of the Higgs. So the nightmare scenario is people discover the Higgs and nothing else. Because it would have been better not to discover the Higgs, because then we know that we don't understand the physics. Yeah? But now they discover the Higgs and nothing else, so they close the standard model and they don't give us any guidance uh, uh, to what happened to the future. So that's, that's a bad future. But also, well, we can, we, we still too early to be too, too much worried because, I mean, this is, too, this is supposed to be running for the next many years, I mean, 10, 15 more years and with more energy and so on. But it's something to think about that this could be a possibility. And we have, uh, we have to wait and see. Uh, but then there are other proposals. Called, one is called supersymmetry. I put question marks. Extra dimensions. Unexpected. This is interesting. And strings. And they're all question marks. And I will try to explore some of them in the next few minutes. How, how many minutes do I have? Ten? Ten is okay? Can everybody survive ten more minutes? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> okay. So supersymmetry. We call it SUSI. After many years working on it, we get familiar with the, with the concept. Uh, and this is a, uh, actually, we, the, there's a conference every year on the SUSI conference every year. We organize it this year at ICTP. It's a major, one of the major conferences in high energy physics. So we've got uh, more than 400 participants and so on. And uh, I had to give an introduction to show how much Abdul Salam had contributed to the field. It was impressive. It was impressive. So, you are curious that my presentation at the SUSI conference, you should show all, all the different papers he wrote. I think he wrote on the order of 10 to 12 papers within the first year of the first paper of supersymmetry, with some of the things we lecture now about supersymmetry, done by him and with his collaborator, John Strandy. <coughs> so he was not only the, one of the fathers of the standard model, but he was also going beyond the standard model <coughs> in this supersymmetry. And what is supersymmetry? One simple thing to say is that since I've been talking about bosons and fermions the whole talk, essentially supersymmetry is, is a symmetry that takes a boson, makes it into a fermion, and then takes a fermion and makes it into a boson. Some people can dramatize this and say that there are extra fermionic dimensions because to make this transition is like changing in a new dimension, which is a, 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 the fermion type. That means an anti-commuting number instead of commuting number. And when you end up with the other boson, you, end, you start with the boson and end up with the boson, but the boson is translated in time or in space. So that means that this is a space-time symmetry. It's deeper than, 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 than most of the It's at the same level of the symmetry of so the special relativity, which is very good. So supersymmetry has been fascinating people for many years. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, it plays an important role at, at, to the searches for the searches at LEC in the next, near future. And uh, this is my way to... to more or less um, illustrated. So the idea is that for each particle that we know, this is Mr. Obama in this case, there is a, a corresponding particle, which we don't know, a super particle, mm -hmm. that is heavier than the particle that we know. If this is a boson, this is a fermion. If this is a fermion, this is a boson. Okay. So that's, that's the story. So the, the new particles, so for every particle we know, there's a new particle, at least. Okay. This is not surprising in physics because that same idea came out in the early days of, of, uh, of um, quantum field theory with the existence of antiparticles. For every particle we know, there's an antiparticle, and then the antiparticles were, were detected. So in a similar way, now, but this is, this is a different nature in the sense that the corresponding particle, if it is a boson, this is a fermion, and so on. And they have to be heavier. They cannot be of the same mass because otherwise we would have seen it. So supersymmetry, supersymmetry cannot be an exact symmetry of nature, but it can be broken. And that's something we have also learned from the Higgs, Higgs mechanism that nature can have many more symmetries than we see. Because if we sit in the minimum of the potential, we are not seeing, we are sitting at the point of broken symmetry. So nature can have many more symmetries, and we are sitting at the broken symmetry point. So that's the idea that we know for the Higgs mechanism and can be for supersymmetry. And I can see for all the particles we have here in the standard models, there are all, uh, corresponding super partners. And some of them, the ones that have zero charge, are the best candidates people know about dark matter. So dark matter people have been observing over the years. And some of the best candidates have been supersymmetric particles. OK. 
Okay, so the challenge for the experimentalists to see is some of these particles can be discovered in LHC. So that's one concrete thing to search. But why do they have, uh, why is it that people can see these particles? It's not just for fun. It is, uh, if these particles have the mass of the TeV, remember they have to be heavier because the uh, symmetry has to be broken. But have to be, TeV means 10 to the 3 GeV. So, so I mean the, 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 the energy that the LHC are, are probing now. <clears throat> they can solve the hierarchy problem. The hierarchy problem is one of the three main problems I was showing to you. The idea is essentially that I told you that this interaction with the quarks or so that makes the Higgs very heavy. So this gives a very heavier mass, uh, contribution to a mass to the Higgs very biggest. Now there's a contribution from the super partner, the partner of the top interacting with the Higgs. And uh, the top is a, is a fermion. This will be a boson. And the contributions come with opposite signs. So if they have the same mass, they cancel identically. So the hierarchical problem is not there. You have exact supersymmetry. But since we know supersymmetry has to be broken, this, the difference of here will be only of the order of the masses of these particles. And if the particles have the mass of the TeV scale, then, then that, that explains why the, the Higgs cannot go heavier than that. So that explains why the Higgs is slight. So this is the best explanation we have for the uh, hierarchy problem. And this is what you call as a naturalness issue. So that you're addressing a naturalness problem that the, the mass was growing very high, and now we solve the naturalness problem by a symmetry, and the symmetry is supersymmetry. Okay, this is a beautiful property of supersymmetry. As a bonus, supersymmetry also gives you that we measure the interactions, the strength of the interactions at the energies of the LHC, the strong interactions, the electroweak interactions, the electromagnetic interactions. We measure them here. They look very different, but we, we know how they change with the energy. And when we extrapolate, if, they, if you have supersymmetry, they all get together into one single coupling. So that means that uh, there will be a, uh, all the forces that they look different at now, they will be unified in one single force. That will be, again, the, the, ex the ex extension of Salam's uh, and Weinberg and Glasgow's uh, 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 contribution of unifying not only electromagnetic and wind interaction, but unifying all the other interactions. Uh, gravity is not included yet here. And this is with supersymmetry, and this is without supersymmetry. So people have done the calculations. If you have supersymmetric particles, then the joining is very good. If you don't have supersymmetric particles, they don't join, period. So that's another argument in favor of supersymmetry. They have, people have been giving that for the last 10 to 20 years. So it's good. It gives you hierarchy. It has the hierarchy problem. It gives you unification. The best candidate for dark matters. It also supersymmetry as a bonus. You compute the energy, and in supersymmetry, they tend to be positive. So this instability issue that goes down, so if you have supersymmetric uh, theory, it doesn't happen. So it addresses this issue. It doesn't address the cosmological constant problem, unfortunately. But it addresses all these elements. And the problem, and this is the problem now, is that people already discovered the Higgs. They're looking for supersymmetric particles over the last uh, few years. And there is no experimental evidence yet for all these particles. And uh, people are starting to get nervous. Why? Because then these particles have not been seen. And we know exactly the mass of the Higgs, so the, the whole picture has to fit. And then that means that, that then the, the, the scale that this, the member of the Higgs, the hierarchy problem of the Higgs cannot go to very high scale. And uh, how heavy can it be is by the mass of the, of the supersymmetric particles. So the super, supersymmetric particles are uh, of the order of the mass of the Higgs, so a bit bigger. That protects the Higgs to get big mass. But now the experiments are putting bounds on these particles, say close to 10 times the mass of the Higgs. So now they start doing, we need some tuning also now to, to adjust the masses of the Higgs not to go that far. Of course, it's not a 15 orders of magnitude as it was before, but now it's two orders of magnitude or so. And then people start to get worried. So the issue that supersymmetry was playing a role by solving this, this naturalness problem, now naturalness is hitting back. And then we, don't, we start worrying again. So this is a question mark. The other thing about supersymmetry is that supersymmetry, so far, it doesn't include gravity. But it is needed in the major theory that includes gravity, which is string theory, the superstrings. So again, it's completely different motivation for, string, for supersymmetry, but it's needed for the consistency of, super, of the string theory. So then I will say some words about the strings, a few words only. <laughs> so the string theory essentially is that all the particles that we see, instead of being points, are little strings. 
And it addresses the main problem that we have in particle physics, which is the problem of gravity at the fundamental level. And this fluctuation means that the fluctuations of the whole structure of space and time, that, that's what gravity is. And that's a, a major problem. And string theory addresses it in a very nice way, in the sense that we, you only assume that particles are close or open strings. And different fluctuations of those strings give you different energies. And the quantization of those energies give you different particles. And in principle, all the particles we know will be excitations of strings, including gravity, which is a closed string. So it predicts gravity at a quantum level. So it addresses this issue of quantum gravity. Uh, unify all the interactions uh, that, that as, as I was saying before, including gravity. But it also predicts that we live in 10 or 11 dimensions, which is not that bad, but it's a bit above what we experiment tell you. Uh, so that means that we have to have our experiment. Our universe has to be the four, ex the four dimensions that we see times some six extra small dimensions, OK? And, uh, and the sizes of these extra dimensions are particles. And they happen to be scalar particles, like the Higgs. And we have plenty of them. OK, so essentially, this is a picture of what the extra dimensions can look like. And then we can live in one object called brain at the end of, of in one place in, 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 in the extra dimensions. There will be all these extra dimensions there. Or this can be our brain. So there are different options. So then it gives us all this very rich structure of in, in, in extra dimensions. And uh, it brings back something I, tell you, I told you before. Having all these different shapes and sizes of the extra dimensions, these were this Higgs-like particles, which are called moduli, they have a potential profiles, potential energy profiles, and they can take many, many minima, many uh, vacuum states. Minima. How many? We don't know. The uh, simplest uh, estimates are of the order of 10 to the 500. 10 to the 500 is a number, but it can be much bigger than that. It can be infinite or something, but it's a huge number. This huge number that is reflected here, that all the different minima that you can see this uh, profile, this is different compactification of different shapes and sizes of the extra dimensions. Also, some fluxes, so like a magnetic fluxes inside and so on. And, uh, and each of them will be a different universe for us. And having all these different universes, you can have this structure that, that then one universe can, can tunnel to other universes by, by tunneling effect in quantum mechanics. Then you can populate what is called the landscape. Okay, when people talk about this, usually, and that's on purpose, I told you the story before. People attach this idea to string theory. And they say, well, it's a speculation or a speculation. Because, you know, string theory is a speculative theory. And then you have all these mini infinite solutions. And maybe it's, it's, then the theory may not sense. I told you that this structure is already present in the standard model, the, the theory that has been tested experimentally. So there's no question about it. So the one who denies the existence of this is, is hiding something. I mean, it's, 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 it has the mind um, not trying to accept what is, 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 is a fact. I mean, there are things that are many solutions. The question that we don't like many of us don't like, I have to say, is how to use this fact. And this, this fact has been used to address the other problem that was, I was pointing to you, which is the, the, the cosmological constant problem. Why is the cosmological constant so small? It's because, well, maybe, why the cosmological constant? Because there are so many minima here that having one with a value of 10 to the minus 120, the chance of having one of this is, is, is high enough because there are many others. And all the other ones, for which the value is bigger, they, they expand so fast that they wouldn't have time to create galaxies. And they are so small, they're smaller, they will recontract very fast. So the ones that, that we can leave is the, is the one that with very small cosmological constant. And then that's a, one of the many solutions, so we are there. I personally don't like as a solution, but I cannot deny that this picture makes a lot of sense. And uh, on, on the other hand, nobody has a better solution for this cosmological constant problem. So it's something we have to admit. And, uh, and so far, is the best solution in town. And not only that it's, only, it's, it's, it's not just one came out of the time. It's something people working on this idea for 50 years. This is the only thing that makes sense so far. And then this is the picture of having one universe going towards other universes. So you start here. Part of the universe uh, tunnels to another universe, which starts expanding itself. This turns to another universe that expands itself, and so on. And one of the many universes happens to be ours. So the fact that we don't like this, many people don't like it, because this brings the word, which is usually forbidden in the scientific literature, which is called the anthropic explanation for the cosmological constant. Uh, but we have to be 
also scientifically correct, in the sense that we, it will be bad as scientists to reject this as an option, because this is what the theory is telling you. And uh, so it's, it's, there's a lot of room for debate for this. Interesting thing is that, believe it or not, Weinberg, in 1987, he made a prediction. And he said, if the solution to the cosmological constant problem is an anthropic, then the value has to be 10 to the minus 120. And then only 11 years later, it was discovered to be precisely the value that he had predicted, essentially. So, with some, so in that sense, it is scientific. There is some scientist, scientific element into that. So it's something not to disregard. And just so that the people who criticize it have thought, that haven't thought enough about it, because this is, this is something, uh, there is a lot of serious uh, thought implied on this, and addresses a major problem that nobody else has the solution. So this is the landscape, and then it has a good thing, as I told you, for supersymmetry, also for, for, the, for what can be seen in the LHC, uh, it allows for the first time to do calculations that people have been doing many years, neglecting this problem. So people say, oh, supersymmetry solves the hierarchy problem, so let's do all these calculations. There's this bigger problem there, cosmological constant, let's just ignore it, and then do these calculations here. Uh, and that usually is not justified, because if there's the bigger problem, whatever solves that problem may change the whole structure of your calculations there. Now we can, we can actually do the calculations and say there is something else there, which is this landscape solution to the cosmological constant, which will not affect the calculations. So the first time that people can actually do calculations uh, and, and check with experiments. Uh, that's the good part. The bad part is that uh, it was sad because explaining the cosmological constant problem has been the dream for many of us because that implies physics at very, very low energies and will have a lot of experimental implications. And apparently, if it is just that we happen to be living there, it may not have it. And the ugly part is something that is what many of my colleagues are doing now. Uh, and it is to uh, use that argument that addresses well the cosmological constant problem to use it for many other, other, other problems. Say, so why don't we use it also for the hierarchy problem? Remember the hierarchy problem? We had this beautiful solution which was supersymmetry with this beautiful constellation of, 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 of uh, the interactions of quarks and the, and the partners. Now they say, forget about that. If the landscape so solves the cosmological constant problem, which has a bigger problem, then the landscape may also solve this problem. And then forget about the beauty of all the supersymmetry. Uh, I think they may be right, but it's very ugly. So, and, uh, but now again, these ideas are becoming more um, fashionable, precisely because people haven't seen the supersymmetric particles yet. And then, then, as I told you, there's already some tension there. So then you say, well, whatever this small tension is can be solved by the landscape. So we live in the universe for which this, uh, this, 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 is, this is solved. Uh, so, uh, right. And uh, something I didn't, yes, I didn't uh, emphasize with supersymmetry. Supersymmetry only presented as one solution for the hierarchy problem. Many other solutions have been proposed for over the years. Models without Higgs or uh, composite Higgs or um, extra dimensions and so on. At the moment, they all look worse than supersymmetry. So the best argument I have now to tell openly to, to, uh, without feeling biased to the community, the best argument that I can see about support, supporting supersymmetry is that it's better than all the competitors <laughs> because all the competitors do look worse. But it doesn't look very good. It doesn't look very good because I've seen the people haven't seen the super partners. My own take on that is that we have to be um, patient. And we have to still celebrate the Higgs. It's only one year and a half that after the Higgs, and then see what happens in the next five years or so with the LHC running. And then if they don't discover anything there, start being worried. But um, there's something to, to at least to keep in mind. Okay, so for the future, and I finish here. Uh, of course, I told you the uh, next year or so, or more, uh, the LHC will restart running with twice the energy and 10 times more data. So I think this is the key moment to start in the next. So this will be very active one year and a half from now or so to start looking forward for the data, new data coming from LHC and for the several years to come. So that's a concrete thing. Then people are talking about what to do next. Since the Higgs has been discovered, so people can start looking for, say, Higgs factories and so on. And there are something called ILC, is a linear colliders, two competitive ones, one proposed, say, in Japan, and the other one probably at CERN. Uh, moon colliders and so on, other, 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 other alternative uh, ex ex experiments. Um, 
different from what has been done so far. The most ambitious I have seen in the, for the next 20 years is uh, the 100 kilometers, 100 TV. Remember that now we are the order of one TV experimental, say 10 TV energies. This will be at least one order of money to, uh, bigger than that. And uh, it would cover, it's 100 kilometers. So you know, if I told you the LHC is 27 kilometers, this will be 100 kilometers in circumference. People have made already the study in, on Lake Geneva because you have to study the stability of the soil and so on. There is room for that. And, uh, and people are taking it very seriously at CERN. There's a, probably a previous experiment to that. Instead of colliding protons, they will collide electrons. That's called TLAP, I think. Uh, that's, uh, that's, as, as, as it happened for the LHC, in the same tunnel that people are running LHC, before, instead of colliding protons, they were colliding electrons. Lower energy, but cleaner. So this could be done as a first stage, and then the second stage to 100 TeV. And uh, there is, I understand there is also a big initiative that China can also do in itself, doing it at CERN. So this will be for the next, say, 20, 20 something years. But also, we don't have to lose track of other experiments being done, and the cosmological observations are very important, particularly for theories like string theory, for which you have to have not only explanation of one particular um, uh, event or one particular uh, 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 experiment, but you have to explain every single experiment. That's, that's the the good and the bad thing about the string theory. So, so you have to look at other experiments in the, in the market and then there are cosmological observations. There are globes now looking at the cosmic microwave background to see their gravity uh, waves. Uh, Planck, which is the satellite I was mentioning before, uh, potential LISA or is revised generation called ELISA uh, for the gravitational waves also. I know, I understand this initi initiative also in India about um, gravitational waves, which is very good. Searching for all the particles like actions, spectra in the whole universe and then clusters of galaxies and galaxies and so on, about all the, the different uh, en energies that we get, you, we receive uh, um, light, say so X-rays, gamma rays, and different scales. That can give us surprises or hints or new physics, say dark, dark matter or so on. So we have to keep this also in mind, not only concentrate on the LHC. But there, there's plenty to come in the next few years, so let's remain optimistic. Okay. Thank you very much. Sure, any questions you have? Yes. I have a question. So, um, so in, in the case of the Higgs, uh, uh, I guess uh, the discovery was possible because it was very clear how it was interacting with other known things. So mm -hmm. it was very clear what to look uh, in the data. Now, uh, is there, I mean, uh, are there other clear signatures which people are looking, at, uh, which one can look in, uh, in further data at LHC for these other things? Or? Yes, for supersymmetric particles, yes. Supersymmetric particles, is, uh, there are a lot of nice, uh, uh, one, one uh, um, if supersymmetry has a property called R parity, so there's uh, like an extra symmetry, so then the lightest supersymmetric particle is stable, and the supersymmetric particles decay in pairs, so you have to see them in pairs and so on. So there's a there are clean signature. That's why they have been, been so, so efficient to rule them out uh, at the scale that they, they have been seen, because you can look for many, many, many different channels. Yes. But of course, uh, that's what I put in some, one of the slides, the unexpected. That's the most difficult part because we don't know what to, to look at. Some, something will come out there and we don't know what it is. But, uh, but at least uh, for what, what people have proposed, there are usually good, good uh, signals to look for. Thank uh, Fernando oh, yeah. once again for his talk. Oh, okay. And uh, I would uh, like to invite you all for uh, okay. some tea actually outside over here. Okay. Thank you.